Welcome back to the Foundries Church YouTube channel. We're excited that you chose to connect. If you want to connect throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to this channel. With that being said, let's dive into the current series called Short and Sweet. Well, here we go into Beauty and the Beast, right? Beauty and the Beast and the book of Philemon. And what I love about this series is, series is the intricacy of finding those little connections, but also realizing many of the connections we find in Scripture, especially the book of Philemon to the story of Beauty and the Beast, are so readily available. They're just right there. So allow me a minute to just refresh your memory, because you and I probably know this story, right? If you're here today, you've probably seen the cartoon, the live action, or is it live action? I don't know if it's live action, but the real people one, and um, let me just give you a quick breakdown of this story. You remember it. Handsome young prin prince is an entitled little jerk, gets cursed by old witch looking for shelter, finds himself transformed into a beast. He's living under a curse, and all those around him are living under the curse that was cast on him. He can only be healed by love, and there's this girl, Beauty, Belle, Bella, if you're me, but that's my daughter, so anyways, Belle. And Belle is this little self-sacrificing young woman. She is kind, she is loving, and what I love about her character is she loves the beast in spite of all his outward appearances. She loves him even when he doesn't deserve it. And what we find is the beast is transformed by love, both giving it and receiving it, and he is remade into what he was created originally to be. He is restored to what the ideal was by the end. And all of those around him, everybody living in the beast's castle, are restored to their former lives. I love this story. And I, I know it's not like, let me just do a quick straw poll. I want your number one character in this. Who's Mrs. Potts? Anybody? Yeah, thank you, Kyle. I appreciate it. And we got Brittany, of course, who was Mrs. Potts. Way to promote yourself at church. Um, so we've got Mrs. Potts. We have Beast. Any Beast fans? Bell? Yeah, most of us are Bell fans. Chip? Lumiere? Can't have two. Lumiere, I like Lumiere. Feather Duster, Cogsworth, right? So you know the characters. If I started like singing B, R, Guest, most of us could stand up and do one of the parts in it, right? We know this story, but we also know another story that I think lines up really well in a frustrating way for us. The, the idea of living under a curse. We understand the reality of living under a curse from Adam and Eve, the very first man and woman. In Genesis 3.16, after they've fallen into sin, what we find is the curse is handed down to the serpent, to the woman, and to the man for their complicit role in sin. And what happens is we all follow in that great tragic train of brokenness and sinful nature. We are not just sinners. Sin isn't what you do, it's who you are, and we find ourselves trapped under this curse. Sin in Scripture is often referred to as slavery, which is perfectly fitted for this story. Because we're enslaved to sin. Paul, the apostle, writing to the church in Rome, says it this way in Romans 6.20. At one time, you were enslaved to sin. You were owned by sin. You didn't have an independent thought in your head. You were driven by your sinful nature and desires. You were enslaved to sin. One of the Old Testament stories that I think points this out really well, just our slavish nature to sin and the effect sin can have on a community, is the story of Achan. Now, Achan was a member of the Israelite community who had been wandering in the desert for 40 years. They come to the promised land. They're going to take the city of Jericho during the, um, the kind of the taking over of the promised land. And when they get there, God says, don't take any of the cattle, any of the silver, any of the gold, any of the fine linens. Leave everything desolate and destroyed. It's devoted to me. And Achan takes some digs a hole under his tent and hides it there. 
the people of God go to fight the city of Ai. And when they get to Ai, they get there and they are routed. They are beat back viciously. And Moses and the people, or Joshua and the people of God are like, what is going on? God, aren't you on our side? How could this happen to us? I thought you were with us. And they inquired of God and then they cast lots. And it went to the tribe that Achan was from. And then the family group. And it just narrowed down till the lot fell on Achan. And he said, yes, yes, indeed, there is something I have been hiding. And he shows them the, the banned things, the things God said, don't, don't take those. Don't take those things. And Achan and his family were destroyed. But here's the thing. Many people lost their lives in the community of Israel. Many people and all their forward momentum was blocked because there was sin hidden in the life of Achan. There was sin hidden in the camp, just like the beast. He was enslaved to sin, and in the story of Achan, we can see that sin always affects the whole community. If I'm living in some secret sin, I guarantee you it is going to show up and be like it will come to fruition in the rest of the church. Right? So goes the leader, so goes the team. And when you look at this, you have to understand, and I have to understand, sin always affects the entire community. So what I want to do tonight or today is take a minute and talk to you about this book of Philemon. There's really three characters we need to get our heads around. They're weird names, so I'm going to walk you through them so we remember. We have Philemon. Philemon is a slave owner. Okay? Now, in the ancient world... Slave ownership was very common. The conquered were enslaved. That's just how it went. I'm not saying any commentary, right or wrong. I'm just telling you that that is how it went. For the conquered, it was a life of subjugation. Many people went into debtor's prison and were enslaved through that. But slavery was a part of the ancient world. And it's part of this story. Philemon is a slave owner. Onesimus is a slave. And then there's the Apostle Paul. He's, well, he's the Apostle Paul, right? Not much mystery there. So he's writing a letter to Philemon, and the courier is a runaway slave named Onesimus. So here's what we know. Philemon lived in Colossae, the city of Colossae. We know it by the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians, that that city was a letter written by Paul to that church in that city of which Philemon was a home host for the church. They hosted the church in their home. And it was about a thousand miles away from where Paul wrote the letter and gave to Onesimus to deliver back to Philemon, which means a poor enslaved Onesimus somehow found money to run a thousand miles and take a shipping voyage to get to Rome where he ends up meeting uh, through some circumstances the Apostle Paul who leads him to Jesus Christ and Onesimus meeting Paul coming to Christ begins to do some work in his own past that needs to be sorted out and Paul realizes that Onesimus is a runaway slave of his friend Philemon and Paul realizes he has to handle this. And in the letter, Paul speaks of the forgiveness that Philemon has experienced through the gospel of Jesus Christ and the restoration to life, and he asks Philemon to extend that same forgiveness to Onesimus. He also speaks, and I love this, he speaks in a countercultural way to Philemon. He says, I know it's the rule of the land, but forget the rule of the land. This is your brother in Christ. That's kind of a paraphrase of it. And we're doing something this weekend that is countercultural to the law of even our lands regarding the right to life uh, petition that's going around. We are pro life at this church, from the unborn to the aged to the immigrant to the orphan to the widow and those who are extorted in any way. We are pro life. And I'm asking this church in some way to take part in signing. This petition, and you may think, well, I don't know if it agrees with me politically. Forget politically. It's life. And God talks about life. Be fruitful and multiply. It's the first command given in Scripture. So when we talk about this, about being countercultural, it wasn't just for Onesimus 
to take a countercultural message to Philemon. It's for me to offer a countercultural message to you that say you can put politics aside. We have to stand up for any life made in the image of God for his plans and purposes. So we can say that we live in a similar tension to what you're going to experience with this pro-life ballot, this anti-dismemberment abortion thing saying no longer will we sit back and justify. We're going to stand up and raise our voice, even if it's offensive to some, especially if it's offensive, because we know God's value on life, and we see it in this book, because Paul says to Philemon, don't just look at Onesimus as your former slave, and don't just forgive him, consider him your brother. It's countercultural. It's uncomfortable. But isn't the gospel always a little bit uncomfortable? Let's read together. The book of Philemon. It's one chapter, about 20, uh, 25 verses. Here we go. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow, fellow worker. Also, Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God and I, as I remember you in my prayers because I hear that your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing that we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Now, we're going to get into the meat of the letter here. And I want you to just, I want you to read it almost from Philemon's standpoint. Check out what Paul does. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what is right, I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Have you, it's, it's already getting a little bit of a rhetorical question going here. It is as none other than Paul, myself, an old man who is also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and me. So what is Paul saying? Make no mistake, I'm writing the letter, and make no mistake, I'm talking about Onesimus and you. So this is an interesting book. Paul's not talking to the whole church in, Col in Colossae. He's talking specifically to the leader of the church to act on behalf of someone who has wronged him. It gets so much better. Okay, here we go. I'm sending him, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. You can't hurt his very heart, can you? Yeah, okay, I, I dig it. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. Okay, a little bit. Well, you guys obviously aren't getting the play on guilt here. I mean, Paul's working him pretty good, isn't he? Here's my heart. I wish I could have kept him, but I, you know, because I'm in chains for the gospel, but I'm sending him to you. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do wouldn't seem forced, but voluntary-ish. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Oh, pet the cat backwards, right? This doesn't go well. Can you imagine? I mean, think about this. He is not a person in Roman society. Onesimus is not a human being. He's property. And he's wronged his slave owner. And um, there is uh, Polio was his last name. Vestuius Polio was one of the, um, the Caesar's nobles in the Roman Empire. And he kept a pond well stocked with moray eels to feed slaves who irritated him into. Because he liked the sound of them being consumed. So just think, no rights. One of the slaves of this polio, he dropped a crystal goblet and was begging for his life in front of Caesar Augustus. And polio's like, no, throw him in the pit. And he's like, no, please. You know what Augustus did? Caesar Augustus is like, come on, give him a break. I'm paraphrasing here, but give him a break. I mean, the guy broke a goblet and he's like, no. 
He's going to pay. So you know what Caesar did? He said, bring me all the crystal goblets in this palace. And he dumped them on the ground and broke them. And he said, what are you going to do to me? So they had no rights. No rights unless someone interceded. They had no rights at all. And when we look at this and understand that Paul is saying this person with no rights who has wronged you and deceived you and stolen from you, don't just take him back as a slave and don't punish him. Treat him not as that weird little brother who does stupid things, but as a dear brother, someone you love very much, as a fellow man. Here's what he says. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you. To which Philemon's like, no, he's not, Paul. He's not, but Paul's making a case. He's even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, if you and I are partners in this church planning mission, which, by the way, they're partners, Paul says this, welcome him as you would welcome me. Welcome him as you would welcome me. And if he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, this is an ironic uh, rhetorical thing, right? That's like me saying earlier today, well, if I preach tonight, well, of course I'm going to come. If I'm going to preach today, of course I'm going to show up and teach. It's, It's rhetorical. It's not if he owes something. Paul knows he owes something. Paul knows what he did. Paul says this. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. This is the worst if you're Philemon. I, Paul, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Remember, I led you to Jesus. Paul's pulling all the punches here. If it's a boxing match, Philemon's taking a nap on the mat, and he's like, kaboom, and dropping elbows on him. He's going off on this. I do wish, brother that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. As though that weren't enough, put a cherry on top, right? Do something even I can't think of. Oh, and one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I'm coming to be restored to you as an answer to your prayers, not mine, to yours. I just love Paul in this. Ephraim, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, and my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Remember when we started talking, the curse that affected all humanity. The curse of Genesis 3. Well, forgiveness is the cure. Forgiveness is the cure. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says this, And Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now catch this. This is the antidote to Genesis 3. To him who loves us and has freed us from sin by his blood. What do we see in that? That Jesus Christ has always been the only cure for sin. The only hope and the only cure for sin is Jesus Christ. And what we realize in this is that forgiveness is something we first receive. We receive it first and we understand that it's the only way for us to ever find any peace and to have the curse of sin broken off our life. It's to be forgiven in Christ Jesus. May we not be unclear on this point. In this church, the only means of peace and hope in this lifetime is this, that you experience the forgiveness of God the Father in the person of Jesus Christ that you receive through confession, repentance, and turning your life to Christ, the forgiveness you need. There is only one way to be freed from the slavery of sin. There's only one way to get loose from what holds so tight to you. It is Jesus Christ, and it's forgiveness through him and through him alone. I love that Genesis 3 and Revelation 1, 5 that kind of holds the tension of this is the result of sin. It is a curse that will make everything painful, even the best things, childbirth, painful. From what I hear, I guess it's super painful. I've never had it, right? But I'll tell you this, 
When we look at the curse of sin, we can feel it. Creation groans, the Apostle Paul says, under the weight of sin. But thanks be to God that to him who loves us and freed us from sin by his blood, we are held. There is an antidote for the curse. There is something that breaks it. And here's the cool news for Philemon. He understands what it means to be forgiven. Philemon was a pagan. He became a Christian through Paul, which Paul reminds him of, which I think is great. Paul's like, don't forget, you owe me your very life. He knows what it is to be freed. He knows what it is to be a slave to sin. Now, I'm sure none of us here today know what it's like to be a slave to sin. So we'll just assume Philemon's the poor sucker who does. But you and I both know there's a deep-rooted issue in our life. An idolatry, a sinfulness, a behavior, a lifestyle that is broken and sinful, and we feel enslaved to it. Philemon knew what it is to be held by something. He knew what it is to live under the curse of death, living as a brute beast by his instincts, his passion, and a spiritless life. He understands also now what it means to be free. He knows how wonderful it is to go from captivity to a new creation, And I want to ask you this question. I never want to take it for granted that anyone sitting in this place may not know what it is to know Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, at the end of this service, you'll have the opportunity to pray with Pastor Phil. And you'll be invited to come up, and you don't have to make some big show. You can just come up and lay it all down at the foot of the cross and be freed from your sin. You'll have an opportunity, whatever service you're at, whoever the venue pastor is, you get the opportunity to come and be set free. And you get the opportunity to know what Philemon knew, what it was to be bound in sin and then set free. And for those of us who have known Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we remember the moment of that wonderful turn, that twist in time and history where our soul was unshackled and unchained and set free in Jesus Christ. We and Philemon know what it is to be freed. We know what it is to be freed. But here's the thing that Philemon has to work with. He has to live with the reality that once we know the cure, we have to start sharing it with everyone around us. We have to start sharing the cure with everyone around us. There is no other way to handle this gospel than through our own lives sharing the cure with those around us. If we've been freed from the curse through forgiveness in Jesus Christ, we must do a couple of things. We've experienced forgiveness. Now we have to do the hard work of forgiving other people. We have to forgive those around us. And here's where it gets really, really dicey because that's tough. I don't know about you, but I have a really hard time forgiving things that have done me wrong. And I know it may feel like we've talked about this, but we can't get away from it. There is a reality to the gospel, the kind of arc of the gospel, that Christ meets us, but he also calls us upwards into him. And to do the divine work of not only receiving forgiveness, but extending forgiveness to people who need it, whether they know it or not. To forgive people and let the love and life of Christ flow out of us. Something you may not know, the Dead Sea in the Holy Land, has no outlet. No water flows out of it. But the Jordan River flows millions of gallons of fresh water into that Dead Sea every day. And it's dead, it's necrotic, and it's worthless for life. Why? Because there's no outlet. There's no flowing out of life. The life of Christ must flow out of us in forgiveness. Philemon must forgive Onesimus. You must forgive that coworker. That friend, your sister, your brother, your in-laws, you have to forgive them. Your former best friend, that coach who didn't spot your talent and all that D1 talent went to waste because of their blindness, you have to forgive them. You have to remember that you once were forgiven and now are called to extend forgiveness in very real and very costly ways. And I know for me like it probably is for you. Forgiveness 
Well, bitterness is far easier and comes much more naturally to me than forgiveness does. Anybody else? Anybody else wrestle with that? Like, I can hate on somebody so easily, just do me one wrong. I'm like, well, I got a list for people like you, right? And you can sign them up and they're on it forever. Forgiveness comes a lot tougher than does bitterness. But remember, remember what the curse of sin does. Remember the beast. His bitter anger cursed his whole community. Remember Achan. His negative jealousy and carelessness towards the community around him cost the lives of his friends, his family, the people he had walked through the exodus from Egypt with, the wandering in the desert. He was finally in the promised land, and he wouldn't take part in the new life. We are challenged. Actually, we are called by Scripture to extend Forgiveness to people. Now, I want to say one thing about forgiveness. Forgiving someone doesn't give them an all-access pass back into your life. You don't have to let someone hurt you again, but you don't have to let them live rent-free in your head, in your spirit. And it's hard. It's hard, and it's not a joke, and it's not a game. But here's the reality. Forgiveness transforms your castle. Remember that story in Beauty and the Beast? When Beast does all he can to protect Belle, and with his own life, he loves her and protects her and dies, and she loves him, and all of a sudden, like, rain, light, drops start falling, and it's all Disney-esque, and he comes to life, and he's reanimated. Here's the joy and the hope that when you forgive people, it brings your life to life. It animates us with the very thing that only God can do. When I think of the Garden of Eden, when God leaned down over the formed body of Adam and he blew the wind of God into him and Adam was animated and brought to life, I think of us very much that way when the Spirit of God fills us and the wind of God moves in our life in such a way that suddenly we are reanimated, we are brought back to life, and everything about us comes to life, and the curse around us is even broken, right? Do you remember when, when all the characters in Beauty and the Beast start popping back into their old form. Lumiere goes from being a candlestick to this like kind of gangly French guy, a little feather duster. She becomes some girl, and like, oh, you know, and they run off, and you're like, oh, that's weird, French, but okay. And, and you're like, oh, they're all becoming people again. And here's the reality. When we extend forgiveness, when we receive and extend forgiveness, When you forgive others as you've been forgiven, you are given the opportunity to live again. You are given the opportunity to live above the bitterness and the strife and the hatred that you maybe have hidden so well in your life. You are given the opportunity to come back to life. And things will seem like it seems in Michigan right around like, I don't know, May 1st, right? When the ground is giving up green earth again, right? And it's just boom, grass is coming up. Tulips are popping out everywhere. Trees are full of leaves. And we who've lived through the barren winter of Narnia, all of a sudden go, life is springing back. Like every day, you can see something new visibly growing. And it's beautiful. Your life begins to look like spring. Things seem as though they're springing back to life. Old necrotic parts of your life are coming back to life. Why? Because you have participated with God in the only act that is redemptive, forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin. And people have probably sinned against you. So you should receive first the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and then invite the Spirit of God to allow you to extend that same forgiveness. To extend that same forgiveness And the reality is this, that for you and I, it's not going to come naturally, but it is going to come supernaturally. God will give you strength through his spirit to do the impossible. 
If I ask you, which I'm not right now, but if I ask you to close your eyes today for just a minute and think of that one or two people who have hurt you so deeply and so badly and just said, forgive them, you'd be like, yeah, whatever. I'm taking eight pretzels and leaving this place, right? I'm just getting out of here. This place is crazy. Because you can't just forgive, can you? Or can he, working through you, do the miracle that is so unlike you and so unlike me? Can he do something in us that seems impossibly hard? And here's the promise. God will give you strength through his spirit to do it. A few weeks ago, I told the story of Corey Tin Boom. And I'd like tonight for you to hear it in her words. Check this out. But it really is true that the first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. One of my great heroes is Corrie ten Boom. She's a Dutch Christian who hid Jews during the war. She was caught and Corrie and her sister and her father went to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Her father and her sister Betsy died there. She's an amazing woman. And after the war, she went and spoke to others about forgiveness. She was speaking in a church in Germany one time and at the end of her talk she recognized the man coming up to her and she could see it was one of the most cruel guards from Ravensbrück. She pictured him as he was then and as he came up to her he said, I was a guard at Ravensbrück. He didn't recognize her but she knew, she recognized him. She could see him and she remembered walking naked past him. She said she felt so cold and so angry. He said, I've become a Christian now. I know I did some very cruel things, but I've received God's forgiveness for the cruelties I've done. And I ask God's grace for an opportunity to ask one of my very victims for forgiveness. Fraulein Ten Boom, once you were forgiven, will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment, I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No, I can't either, but he can. Thanks for joining us today. If you would like to prepare for next week's message, please click on the link below to get to our devotions. Now, devotions are an important part of the weekly rhythm at the Foundry Church. We hope that God spoke to you through this message, and we also hope that you join us again next week, because it's going to be great.